Voltron, Tumblr shippers ruin everything. From fans circulating undisclosed concept art to and trying to hold it at ransom to get their ship's cannon, to death threats to the voice cast forcing them to not attend conventions, and people even trying to petition the show to be taken off Netflix because of the same overreactionary issues we've seen a million times before. Voltron was a garbage fire. Or at least the fandom was. Okay, at least with how the show ended. I guess the petition isn't completely unfounded, but we'll get back to that in a second. We see history repeat itself, where a bunch of teenagers think they're doing the right thing by being overly protective and progressive of what they love to where it ultimately ends up hurting the exact thing they're trying to protect along with everyone around them. Pretty much exactly what we're seeing with the Monster High fandom. But Voltron was a million times worse and a million times bigger. Animated by the same studio that did Korra, Voltron Legendary Defenders is a reboot slash reinterpretation of the 1980s Voltron. In the beginning, this show was one of the best. Well animated, well written, interesting premise, and breathed new life into the Voltron franchise. You got Shiro, the white-haired anime protagonist that was abducted and has amnesia because of course he does. Don't worry, the angsty freakazoid who single-handedly brought back the mullet, which I'll never forgive Keith for, saves him. And Finn the Human is there too, except now he goes by Lance. You're a cargo pilot. Fighter class now, thanks to you washing out. I'm Pidge. Pidge the smidge from Brooklyn Bridge. The aliens are searching for looks a lot like a Fraunhofer line. The, the wavelength looks like this. I get that's supposed to be a cool transition, but this suggests that the wavelength of an element mirrors the natural landscape around it, which is just wrong. That being said, there's a lot of shows that try to do the techno mumbo jumbo and do it really bad, often just relying on saying, <laughs> according to my calculations, and adding some scientific buzzwords to make the character sound smart. But anyone above the age of five knows it doesn't make sense, usually. Voltron, however, actually does a decent job with their mumbo jumbo, some of it actually making sense. They also have the benefit of the robot kitty cats being magical, having a cool psychic link with a person. Anyway, they quickly find what they're searching for because they know we want the big mecha man and they, with their, they're gonna give the, the, they're gonna give us the big mecha man. Big bad evil alien empire because everyone loves a Star Wars empire but with aliens and scarier. I'm sure Star Wars fans are going to be leaving me an incredibly well-worded comment telling me how I'm wrong as if that isn't exactly what I wanted because I'm not going to read all of those books. Also, shout out to everyone who pre-ordered the Elaine Demi Toss skate deck. I uh, don't know what I'm gonna be doing another pre-order, but I know what I'm gonna do next. There's so much glare, you can't even see what that is. I think I hear something. I'm hearing it too. Oh, oh, my, oh. Come on. How does this guy end up getting the girl? I swear, you know, if the Tumblr shippers had one thing right, it's that Lance and Alora is a weird couple. Speaking of which, here's Alora. Princess and member of an endangered species. Also, her funky butler man. We've been asleep for 10,000 years. So, you just woke up from cryo sleep and are part of an endangered people. <laughs> hey, do you happen to know airbending? Alora is spiritually connected to the lions, and so she's the key to Voltron, meaning she can't die. Oh, thank goodness. It would have sucked if she was killed off. Oh yeah, sure, just drop me off at an alien planet. That's cool, man. It's only occupied by me and purple aliens. Purple aliens? Hey, man, why you gotta bring their skin color into this? Good kitty. Call good me kitty. a good kitty. Good kitty. I can be your good kitty. kitty. Yes, good kitty. kitty. Yes. I love the smell of smaller robots turning into a bigger robot in the morning. Look at that bad boy. God, I love Mecha. I wish there was more Mecha than just Gundam. Mecha is really a dying genre that every once in a while we get treasures like Voltron or uh, specific Pacific Rim, but now both are pretty much gone. Why is that? Giant Robots is a universally agreed upon super cool thing. How is there not a lot of big robot shows that make the mainstream? 
We see a lot of this space witch doing stuff instead of the big bad guy because we gotta save the final boss for the finale. Smidge and Shiro are the two most interesting characters right from the get-go. Shiro being abducted and given a cool robot arm and the mystery of his amnesia, and Smidge desperately trying to figure out where their brother and father is. And as time progresses, we slowly get hints as to what happened while Shiro was abducted. The two of them technically have the strongest bond since both their goals coincide with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your brother and father would be proud of you, Katie. Huh? Your secret's safe with me. Yeah, I don't want to keep it a secret too if I had a girl's name. That's gotta be so embarrassing. Both of us had our fathers taken away by Sarkon. Yeah, but I'm going to get mine back. Shots fired! Shots fired! Home base gets blasted harder than my ass. A great thing about season one is that there doesn't feel like there's a singular main character. You definitely feel there's certain characters that get more limelight than others, especially Smidge and Shiro, but the other characters have a certain level of focus on them as well. And the writers did a good job trying to establish each character the best they can. Except maybe Lance. Lance is really just comedy relief. Separating the characters is probably the best thing they could have done, not only because we've already seen them work as a team, but splitting them up allows them to shine in their own way while they tackle their own situations. And we get to see how competent or incompetent they are. And in this sequence, the characters that were clearly skewing toward being the main character, like Lance and Shiro, are put out of commission so that the other characters are allowed time to flesh out. Like Hunk. He's not really the best fighter or strategist, but he's good at reaching people's hearts and listening to their problems. He leans slightly more toward the peacekeeping aspect of being a paladin, and we wouldn't have seen that if we kept the team together and focused on him only making food jokes all the time. We are a good team. It sounds like the mice did more than you, though. I punched Sendak! We had a bonding moment! Excellent reference material for my class, Sandsack. You stay in there and don't come out! Just so there are no secrets between us anymore, I'm a girl. Oh, that makes so much more sense. Pidge is a girl. Stuck in a guy's body. <laughs> Jokes aside, they get the crystal fixed up, and the castle is a big ol' ship, so they culturally devastate the indigenous people's religion by having their big monument blast into the sky. I never understood why the big bad evil guy wouldn't just go straight to the main characters. I know they don't want to just crush the team and have the bad guy win, and I guess it'd make sense that the big bad guy is is he doing his own evil conquering? But Voltron is supposed to be the most ultimate awesome power in the universe, so I would think he'd want to deal with this personally. Season one is hard not to love. It's a bunch of rookies not knowing what they're doing, forming a team and figuring things out. Very underdog of a beginning and they slowly come into their own as time goes on. It focuses on team-based situations that require them to step outside of their comfort zone and learn how they can contribute to the team in their own unique way. Alora's character is one of the most tragic. All the rest of the team all have someone to go back to, a goal more than just saving the universe. Alora's situation is cruelly simple. She lost her home and even lost the AI of her father Father, feeling the pain of losing her father twice. She doesn't really have anything to cling to. Her whole self is either to hold on to the noble goal of defeating Zarkon to save everyone, or the selfish goal of defeating Zarkon for revenge. And the way her character evolves hinges on what road she takes. The great part about Voltron is that it feels like the strategies they use for a rebel group taking down an empire feels more real. It's not finding the one ultimate weakness that will conveniently take down a whole battalion. It's them taking small victories where they can, collecting information, and trying to form strategies as time goes on, pivoting their plans with the more information they get, and trying to recuperate whenever things go south all the while slowly obtaining the upper hand. 
This sort of setup, the rebel group facing an insurmountable empire, works better in long-form media, like a television series. The problem with Star Wars is that they're all movies constricted by the two-hour time slots. Voltron takes that same premise and instead uses the time they have episode per episode to let that concept breathe and take full effect. They're able to explore more of the realistic aspects of this situation. A little less magic, a little more tactical. And that's why Star Wars The Clone Wars feels so impressive, and it's for those same reasons. Classically, the Galra Empire finds a way to mine a new power source that's super duper powerful, mirroring the arms race of real world wars as they desperately attempt to keep the upper hand. Weird stuff is happening to Keith. Allura does the super noble, you have to leave without me trope, so she gets captured. But now your new paladins will come for you. Super Juice Zarkon can willpower Voltron apart. Big man, big scary. The Black Lion will finally be returned to its original paladin. Now that's what you call a plot twist. A plot twist is supposed to answer questions. And that answers questions the show didn't even lead you on about. Out. Where was the Black Paladin's Bayard? With Zarkon, because he was the Black Paladin. Easy. But how did the Empire gain so much power so quickly and manage to take down a super advanced civilization like the Altaeans? Because Zarkon betrayed them. People weren't even thinking about how he acquired so much power when this season came out. Also, did I mention that I have a Patreon where you can get monthly holographic stickers and trading cards? Links in the description below. They grab Allura, you always gotta save the princess. You should have called Mario. This is his whole MO. Season one is a neatly wrapped up beginning to what it was supposed to to be a great story, and showing Zarkon using the Bayard and showcasing his skills also foreshadows the greater power the Paladins can eventually obtain later down the line. Sure, they gotta fight a guy more experienced, but it's also exciting seeing that they can also reach that level if they survive. They get some help from someone on the inside, and they delta the fuck out of there. Zarkon gets a little taste of his own medicine. You betray, you get betrayed. There's no honor among big, big mini jerk faces, but the wormhole collapses and we end on a cliffhanger. Season one is a strong start for the series. I wouldn't say it's the strongest start I've ever seen to a series, but they did a really good job. And it's all wrapped up in a neat little bow, setting up some questions, delivering the answers with a well-timed twist, even if it was a little predictable, they did a good job. I know I was hooked when I saw this season. It does a lot right. And it cements itself as a great staple for animation. Everyone gets split up across space, strangers in who knows what lands. One of the great things about science fiction is that it allows you to have multiple different settings, allowing multiple different scenarios. Sure, fighting an empire is cool, but survival scenarios are also fun, or going through temporal loops. Science fiction is about exploring these concepts and ideas, trying to think of different scenarios and treating it like a puzzle, trying to solve it through story. This show skews about 70% science fiction and 30% science fantasy, if you ask me. And though it may not explore any unique ideas, it does take what's already been explored and does it its own way very well. Someone else gets blamed for letting Voltron get away, and then the actual traitor gets a promotion! Voltron is like a solid blend of Star Trek and Star Wars, wrapped up in a neat anime-styled package. When we aren't taking notes from Star Wars about rebel groups fighting insurmountable odds, it's taking notes from Star Trek about different cultures and odd situations that require unique approaches. It really is a show that delivers to both types of fans. He just got blasted by a space witch and mauled by giant lizards. What dream could be worse than that? Well, I can think of something worse. I'm breaking up with you. No! There being a traitor amongst Zarkon actually answers more questions. The question of, how the heck did Shiro escape from being experimented on in the first place? 
You can tell that the writers had all these details really thought through before they were greenlit far beyond where they intended to end the series. Cool stealthy Ninja Man gets on the ship. Ninja Man is the Galra friend that helped Shiro. We are called the Blade of Marmora. Rolling the Rs is mandatory. Turns out the minefield is a pocket dimension for the Blade of Marmora. Bad guy comes and ruins the fun. Don't worry, here's a flash drive on how to find the Marmora HQ. Shiro, you're our only hope. Squidge unlocks nature powers while on a super advanced techno planet. <laughs> Fatality. Zarkon keeps tracking them, and they don't know why, and they gotta keep running because big scary big bad man big and bad and scary. We finally know how Zarkon is tracking us. It's through the Black Lion. So Shiro and the Black Lion go on a bonding trip, and the Black Lion starts telling Shiro all about his past. Zarkon does some Jedi mind reach astral projection thing, and so Shiro needs to 1v1 Zarkon for control over the Black Lion. And it's really awesome. I love these metaphysical battles of will. The Black Lion realizes Shiro isn't a big jerk face, so the Lion chooses Shiro. Season two heavily focuses on each character learning bits and pieces about themselves, developing deeper connections with their lions and growing as a paladin, all of them unlocking new abilities as they slowly learn what it truly means to be a paladin and defender of the universe. It's about growth, more literally in Pidge's case. The lions having their own level of conscience and focusing on their bond between the paladins may be leaning into the anime aspect of it all, but rather I like to think of it as a different interpretation of biology. Biology has exceptions to all the rules, and the combination of both technology and biology to such an advanced degree creates what looks to be either magic or sentience. And since this show focuses heavily on being a team, having the lions be sentient makes sense. The lions shouldn't just be machines, they need to be characters for the sake of making a more interesting story. Season 2 also focuses on Keith and Shiro's relationship. How Shiro sees Keith's potential and has a lot of heart-to-heart -heart telling him that if anything happens to Shiro, Voltron still needs a leader, and so he takes Keith on as a protege, trying to instill in him the ethics of leadership that Shiro has, thus creating the Shiro x Keith shipping. Don't you dare talk about that sheep scum. The paladins finally get to meet up with the Blades of Marmora. They say, hey, we don't trust you. And so Keith needs to go through a trial to prove himself. Even though fighting good doesn't really prove trust, but they all know Keith doesn't have the skill to beat them. Instead, they're testing if he's able to handle the pain of what's to come in this war. And Keith has to go through his own test of will. Challenge after challenge, fight after fight, getting beat down over and over again. The test evolves into his own mind, showing him his life in a dream, and he's forced to make a choice. Either chase the past, learn what the knife means and why it calls to him, what it could mean about his parents, or to chase the future and commit to being a paladin. And even after being told he'll never get to learn about his past, if he walks away, he commits to his role and connects with the Red Lion. It doesn't matter where I come from, I know who I am. Funny enough, that's what was needed to awaken the blade, so Keith wins both. The only way this is possible is if Gaura blood runs through your veins. Oh, are we doing like a Star-Lord type of situation? Did his dad get freaky with an alien? Alora is being kind of racist towards Keith since she found out he's Galra. I mean, I get it, the Galra made her race nearly extinct, but also like, come on, it's Keith. It's okay, they make up and apologize. The traitor that helped the paladins gets captured. Keith helps get him out, and now they're buddies. Keith yeets himself out of there. Traitor guy sacrifices himself to blow up the power in Zarkon's ship, so now the big bad evil guy is a sitting duck. Then Allura uses this super duper big wormhole machine that the super smart guy made in order to warp Zarkon and his ship into the very far away place, so he's not a problem anymore, and they zoom in there with him. They're now all in super far away place. Now the final boss fight happens. But remember the creepy witch lady? The 
ship doesn't have power, but she does. So they make a big scary ball that does a creepy tendril at Voltron and now they're in trouble. And Zarkon has his own big mecha robot angel. Every good JRPG makes you fight a god at the end. So I think this counts. Connect with your lions, reach out to each other. Reach out to each other. Use the power of friendship. Alora shoots a big laser beam at Zarkon, but then he uses a big mirror to throw it back at her. So now she's down for the count. Everything seems hopeless. All seems lost. The heroes are at their lowest, and if I know anything about the hero's journey, that means this is when they find a super cool new power or some sort of inner will they didn't know they had, and they get back on their feet for the final fight. Voltron gets back online, and we get a sci-fi anime fight that we always wanted. Alora's fine, don't worry. Giant laser beams can't keep her down, and her and the Blades of Marmora start taking down the witch druid people. Zarkon does a Freddy and says, let's split up, gang. The Black Lion says, yo, you need that Bayard thingy. So Shiro dives straight for Zarkon. Don't ask me how, but he does the metaphysical thingamajig and takes the Bayard from him. Not sure how that works, but then again, I don't understand astral projection. They make Voltron again. Allura kicks butt, but it turns out which lady is Altaian, just like Allura. And then Allura sucks up that quintessence because miracles are cool, I guess. Looks like it's an Altaian thing. So that wraps up that fight. Time to see what that Bayard do, and it makes the sword go burr. So that means Voltron wins, Zarkon go boom, universe is saved. They delta out of there, and the day is saved. Thanks to the power up. Wait, wait, where's Shiro? Curse that astral projection nonsense. Oh, also, apparently, giant explosions don't kill Zarkon. Summon Prince Lotor. Looks like a major win for the Paladins, but we got greenlit for more seasons. That would have been a great win way to end the series. It was satisfying, but Netflix saw how popular Voltron was getting and told the writers, hey, don't end it. And the writers are like, oh, it's fine. We actually have some loose ends. We haven't fully explored yet, so that's cool. But it's okay. The show doesn't go bad yet. Season two, I would rank nearly the same as season one. We got to see the paladins grow. There was some infighting, but that, that got wrapped up. And we got a super cool, super big boss fight. Knowing what I know now, I kind of wish they ended Voltron at season two, but they didn't. So let's see what they had to make up in season three. Everyone's been doing Voltron stuff on their own and Keith seems really upset that his boyfriend Shiro isn't there anymore. There's a power vacuum, so now there's talk of fighting for the throne now that Zarkon is taking a nappy poo. And we get to see Lotor, Prince of Zarkon, and the incumbent Tumblr sexy man. Lotor got his D&D buddies to spy on people thinking about insurrection, so that's super embarrassing for that one guy. Have Throck transferred out to the Ulipa system immediately. Let him rot with the ice worms. The writers knew that everyone would be upset that Shiro was gone. So if you get rid of one white-haired protagonist, you gotta replace him with an even sexier white-haired antagonist. <laughs> Anyway, Mr. Mullet is gonna be the one in the Black Lion from now on, even though he really doesn't want to. I don't know, I would have liked Alora in there, but this makes more sense. Alora kinda gets cucked by both lions, so now she's feeling really pretty crappy since nobody wants her. I like how they didn't have Zarkon's defeat be the end of the Galra Empire, because it really just doesn't make sense. You defeated the king. Not the Empire. A singular person does not make an empire. You know all those movies where it's like, ah, we need to destroy the queen. Boom. Haha, -ha, now the entire alien horde is dead and destroying and blowing up because they had a big self-destruct button. Or with Star Wars where they had a big self-destruct button. It's a very satisfying and very easy way to tie up a story. But they were also sort of gearing up for season three and so I'm glad that they didn't stick with that trope. Turns out Lance is gonna take the red lion and Alora gets the blue lion, so it's all good. We just had to do a little switcheroo. I guess when it comes to the personalities of the lions, this makes more sense. I would have liked it if the red lion chose Alora to foreshadow some deep-seated emotional turmoil that we would later explore, but that's not happening. Oh well, this is fine too. They find an Altaian spaceship caught in a weird freaky space-time wormhole, so they go into an another reality in order to rescue some Altaians. 
We get to learn a little bit about how Voltron was made and why it's so powerful. As much as I'd like it to be cool space magic, it's really just a super powerful comet that they found. The Hoctrill. What does that do? It saps the fighting force from our enemies. Their will, you might say. <gasps> We start getting a solid look at Alora. Season three focuses on her to a T, seeing how she has to be given hope and have that ripped away from her as she fights for what she believes in and how much she struggles internally as she's desperately trying to live up to her father's footsteps. She wants to help more than anyone. She's the one with the most skin in the game. And sometimes she's on the sidelines to make way for the paladins. But now we get to see how she acts when she's in the front lines. It puts her to the test. Oh, and Lotor takes that special comet, so now he can make his own Voltron. Hey, remember Shiro? Yeah, don't worry, I forgot about him too. I was too busy thinking about Lotor. Anyway, he's alive, I guess. The Black Lion feels Shiro escaped captivity, and they go to rescue him. Wait, does this mean Allura isn't gonna be a paladin anymore? Aw, oh, man, not really, but aw. There is a solid amount of people who dropped this show around season three because they didn't like how Shiro was gone and the paladin's lions were switching. Comment below if you dropped the show around season three. How are you feeling? Just trying to get rid of this weird headache. Don't you love how this show just casually foreshadows stuff and makes it seem like it's casual conversation? I like it. It's not in your face. It really makes a second watch through worth it. Black Lion is being a little sourpuss and is giving Shiro the cold shoulder. Almost like it can sense something wrong with Shiro. Hmm. Lotor made a new super slick ship out of the comet's core. So that spells bad news, bros. The ending of season three is really just a flashback episode showing us King Alfor and Zarkon back when they were friends and how they got the comet and developed Voltron and how the relationship between Alfor and Zarkon started breaking down. <gasps> what is that? He is from our reality. I appreciate them explaining why the big bad evil guy became big and bad. I don't much care about how quintessence from an alternate reality just corrupts them, but I do like why they went so far as to ignore them being corrupted. They wanted to use the alternate reality portals to expand their understanding of science, and Zarkon realizes that Quintessence allows them to become immortal. They knew Quintessence was the answer to more power and to further their knowledge. It was blind pursuit of science that pushed them over the edge. And Zarkon uses the space-time reality rift to flood his girlfriend with creepy multiversal alien monsters which made them into horrible evil bad guys. And now we know why Zarkon is big bad. Quintessence is good and bad. Good energy, bad juju. I'm noticing a lot of stories like to use the this thing corrupted them and there that's why they're bad. And it's upsetting how they don't have an actual motive for the villain other than they became evil, so they do evil things. Season three is a very awkward season. Not a lot is really accomplished. I feel like it's a transitory season, which is very upsetting because it felt like the previous two seasons could have stopped there. Like, it felt like they, it, it was wrapped up in a pretty well-made bow. Season three isn't. Season three feels just like a loose end. I see that the writers are fleshing out their plans, which I'm happy about. Like with Zarkon's wife being Altaian, and Lotor and the Comet, and how all of these are just falling into place. But it just feels like the story is losing direction somewhat. And that could be fully intentional, seeing as we're not supposed to know what Lotor's plans are, and so we're kept in the dark because the Paladins are kept in the dark. You know, his plan other than to defeat or capture Voltron. It doesn't leave much for us, the audience, to ruminate about what's about to happen. Season three is the weakest season thus far. I wouldn't say it's really that bad, but it's the weakest. And also that's what you get when you drop, go from like 12 to 13 episodes to seven. That was sudden. And this is only part one of my deep dive into the Legend of Voltron. Leave your comments below about your takeaways of the first three seasons. And tell me if you agree or disagree with what I said. I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay beautiful and keep playing.